My name is John Wilkinson and it's my pleasure to introduce Chiku Reddy this afternoon. I've developed this kind of unfair reputation for hyperbole in introductions, which <laughs> it's important I should correct, especially as Chiku has told me of his discomfort with immoderate praise. So one way to do understatement was modelled for me recently in England, well, where else? So I'll reproduce that before starting out on the proper introduction, and it went something like this. Uh, it's my great honour and privilege to introduce... Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got my lips on my lips. <laughs> uh, Two lamb's livers, one for the uh, um, Chiku Red, Chiku Red. Um, and um, I'm sure everybody here knows Chiku's work, so I won't drag on any longer. So over to you, Chiku. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's how it went. I kid you not. Well, I'm not going to pretend I don't know Chiku. Um, and because I do, I really feel a pleasurable anticipation in introducing this talk. Uh, Chiku's advice is going to be talking about the poetics of wonder in Homer, the Shield of Achilles. I, I think we could actually have a day conference of Chicago accounts of the Shield of Achilles by now. John Milton in Paradise Lost, in particular the brief description of Satan's shield, and Ronald Johnson in Radios. There seems to me something heroically unfashionable in talking about wonder, at least outside religious discourse. For after all, to be dumbfounded in front of an art object is something teachers and scholars would do anything to avoid. Talking any nonsense is preferable to that. Or digressing, interestingly, of course. So it occurs to me that much of Chiku's work has been driven by a kind of classroom neurosis. There was a book on digression, this work on wonderment, and his brilliant and hilarious poetic work in progress, Readings in World Literature, is based on after-death experiences in the classroom. Courting death might seem an extreme reaction to facing a class, but I'm reminded of that obituary which recently went viral and said something like, Faced with a choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, she, the dear departed, fled to the arms of Jesus. So, faced with a choice between wonderment and digression, or between perhaps close reading and digital humanities, Chiku promptly throws in his lot with Thoth, as would we all. It's significant that today's talk started as a Badly Wright lecture. And the Bagley Wright is a travelling lecture series, taking lectures to several cities around the US. It's reserved for distinguished poets, and the audience isn't confined to scholars and students. The lectures are subsequently published for a general readership. And I just slipped in that point about distinguished poets, for Chiku certainly is that, and is perhaps particularly distinguished in that he isn't associated with any literary, recognizable literary group, but his work is read and respected across all the schisms in contemporary American poetry. His book Voyager is one of a handful of repurposed, treated poetic texts that I'd count truly successful, along with Ronald Johnson's work and Tom Phillips' Ahumiament, and it has a political edge which some others lack. You'd have to go to, I think, prose works by William Burroughs or Kathy Acker to see texts comparably tormented into revealing their dark underside. If wonder is felt on gazing at a shield, then evidently a shield becomes yet more effective. The wanderer is stopped in his tracks. But is it the beauty of the shield that halts the wanderer, or a sudden glimpse of his own wonderment in the shield's polished surface? When we are left open-mouthed by a work of art, does that come from a stunned recognition, an encounter with our posthumous double, whom we strive to ward off? Wondering, we are caught between a sense of being more than ever alive and being called by death. Is this the syzygy of Chiku's subtitle, which may be uh, an opposition or a conjunction, or both at once if you're a poet? Having revealed myself already through digression to be incompetent to face a subject, I invite Chiku to talk about wonder without hesitation, deviation, or repetition, and to keep us as entranced as I know he will. Chiku. Thanks, John. I should have known that you'd basically say everything I am going to say in the next hour uh, much more uh, pithily. And thank you guys for coming. So I'm going to actually give a version of one of these lectures that I've been delivering uh, as part of the Bagley Wright series. But, uh, and as John said, it's, uh, it's a talk that's intended for civilians, really. <laughs> As I was looking it over last night, I realized that there's some things I'd like to think a little bit further about, and hopefully you 
alcohol can help me to do that. But the thing that's really interesting, that's becoming interesting to me about wonder, is uh, something that, that Heidegger says in his uh, lecture on wonder uh, at Freiburg, and uh, in, in which he kind of does this amazing kind of anatomization of wonder. And he's very, very certain that what many people describe as wonder is actually not so, uh, not the case. Heidegger's point is that wonder is only, only can be felt for the whole world. So uh, if you if if you say oh well that iPhone is a is, I feel wonder at the iPhone, you're actually not feeling wonder in under Heidegger's account. He would say you're marveling at the iPhone or you're astonished by your mother-in-law's behavior. But wonder is is only applicable to a, a apprehension of the world in its entirety. So it's kind of this kind of cosmological feeling. And it's, that's what distinguishes it from other forms of affect that we ordinarily identify with individuals or you know, feelings for persons or things. So the first the talk is in three parts. The first is called The World, and I'll jump right in. Let's begin with an early wonder of the Western literary tradition. In book 18 of the Iliad, the god Hephaestus forges a shield for Achilles, who's lost his armor in the bloody fog of war. But as Hephaestus works the shield's surface, this peculiar blacksmith, being a god after all, simply can't resist creating a world too. And there's the tiny world there. There he made the earth, and there the sky and the sea, and the inexhaustible blazing sun, and the moon rounding full, and there the constellations, all that crown the heavens. A little creation myth blossoms amid the slaughter, as Hephaestus hammers not only the earth, but within the brief passage of three dactylic hexameters, the totality of the known cosmos onto the shield as well. And he's only just getting warmed up, really. Over the next 150 lines of the poem, which you have, Hephaestus emblazons the shield's surface with a compact survey of ancient civilization, including the arts of war, law, agriculture, animal husbandry, astronomy, music, dance, and so on. A sensualist at heart, he sets this panorama buzzing all over with Epicurean minutiae, I should say proto-Epicurean minutiae. We see bunches of lustrous grapes in gold, ripening deep purple. We hear a boy plucking his lyre so clear it could break the heart with longing. The point being that you get these different aspects of the sensorium on the shield, right? And we even taste the savor of a cup of honeyed mellow wine. This is all in the Fagel's translation. Not bad for a piece of antiquated military equipment. Faced with such artistry, I can't help thinking of the shield's disabled maker as a kind of poet, like the blind Homer himself. Isn't every poet a crippled little god after all? Sure enough, Hephaestus incorporates, um, incorporates a miniature epic into the shield's pageantry too, with its own besieged city, fraught war councils, interfering gods, and loved ones watching anxiously from the ramparts as a tiny surrogate Hector is hauled through the slaughter by his heels. It's in line 625 in your... No wonder Homer describes the shield as a world of gorgeous immortal work. It contains an entire Iliad and more within its gilt compass. Beguiled by Homer's art, some readers have even tried to reverse engineer real shields from this literary blueprint over the millennia. Probably the most spectacular example of all time was fabricated for display at George IV's coronation banquet by the sculptor, draftsman, and Homer enthusiast, John Flaxman, in 1821. It's a marvel of 19th century British punctiliousness in low relief. Here we find bunches of lustrous grapes in gold, a boy with his lyre, and that cup of honeyed wine, all meticulously accounted for. And yet I can't help feeling that this luminous artifact offers, at best, only a low resolution copy of the Homeric original. Let's zoom in for a moment on those golden hounds at their master's feet to have a closer look. 
I'm not sure why Homer enumerates the figures in this tableau with such exactitude amid all the shield's masses, and they're really throngs and throngs of figures on the shield. And this is Homer. And the golden drovers kept the herd in line, four in all, with nine dogs at their heels. So I'm not sure why Homer's supposed to, so, so numerically specific, but it offers us a perfect opportunity to check John Flaxman's work for quality control. Four drovers, you can count them there, right? Check. Now let's count the dogs. You might think I'm being persnickety here, and with good reason, but bear with me just a little longer. So where is that ninth hound? Marianne Moore once famously claimed that emissions are not accidents. It's hard to say whether Flaxman's missing hound is an omission or an accident, but it makes me wonder. Listen carefully, and you'll hear the poor beast barking, cringing away, somewhere in the vaporous limbo between fiction and reality. Paws flickering, and again, that's Fagel's. It's a creaturely cipher for what's lost when we translate the virtual into the real. The former U.S. Army cryptographer and Homer enthusiast, Cy Twombly, illustrates this splendidly in oil, crayon, and graphite in his postmodern Shield of Achilles a century and a half later. You won't find our missing hound here either, and that's precisely the point of Twombly's abstraction. All those kinetic scribbles convey Homer's energia, or literary energy, but they also make an absolute hash of the shield's pictorial imagery. Not even a cryptographer can code so much world into so small a space. A kind of running interest that I'll be curious to talk about with you afterwards is technology as well, right? Writing technologies and military technologies like shields and, and how they relate to wonder. Whether you reconstruct it like Flaxman or deconstruct it like Twombly, the shield of Achilles will forever remain an impossible object. It belongs to that wondrous category of things that are larger inside than outside, like a poem, or a person, or a world. The world is not the mere collection of the countable or uncountable, familiar and unfamiliar things that are at hand, writes Martin Heidegger in The Origin of the Work of Art. But neither is it a merely imagined framework added by a representation to the sum of such given things. The world, Heidegger writes, worlds. Homer's shield isn't a picture of all the countable or uncountable things. It's not a tally of star systems, ripening grape clusters, flickering hounds that populate the world. As Flaxman and Twombly discovered, it can't even be pictured at all, but it worlds. All the many men who see it will wonder at the sight, Hephaestus predicts as he hammers the glowing cosmos on his forge. If you were to survey the reader's responses to this literary marvel over the millennia, from the anonymous commentators of antiquity to moderns like Alexander Pope and G.E. Lessing to undergraduate term papers in Hume 101, you'd end up with something like a brief history of wonder in Western civilization. Describing the plowman at work on the shield's figured surface, Homer himself is the first among mortals to express wonder at its construction. And the earth churned black behind them, like earth churning, solid gold as it was. That was the wonder of Hephaestus's work. I can't imagine a more gorgeous description of humanity's passage through the dark field of world. The earth churned black behind them, like earth churning. But why doesn't Homer say the, sh the shield's golden surface churned like earth churning? This Mobius strip of a simile is a marvel in its own right. Spellbound by Hephaestus's artistry, we forget that the shield's a shield in the first place. It's a tautological simile, right? 
So we feel that we're watching soil behave like itself. It's a kind of reverse alchemy where gold becomes dirt, vehicle becomes tenor, and shield becomes world. Sometimes it seems there's no escaping wonder before such worlding work. Of the golden women depicted in the shield's wedding procession, Homer writes, each stood moved with wonder. I'm not sure whether we should envy or pity these embossed figures, forever frozen in transport at the wonder they inhabit. But here's the thing. Though Hephaestus prophecies that all the many men who see it will wonder at the sight, none of the many men in the Iliad, Trojan or Greek, ever marvel at the shield's construction. Achilles' fellow soldiers won't even look at the god's radiant work. None dared to look straight at the glare, each fighter shrank away. Only a blind genius could invent such tragic optics. Homer embeds a gilded cosmos in the midst of the epic for his readers to marvel at through the ages. But the Iliad's inhabitants remain forever blind to this wonder hidden in plain view. Beholding his gift from the gods, even Achilles, who's the only mortal who scrutinizes the shield's figured surface in the poem, fails to wonder at the sight. The more he gazed, the deeper his anger went. And anger is where we'd expect wonder, right? <clears throat> the deeper his anger went, his eyes flashing under his eyelids, fierce as fire, exulting, holding the god's shining gift in his hands. Rage, Minas, is the first word of the Iliad, and we usually associate it with blindness rather than perception. I was blinded, lost in my inhuman rage, says Agamemnon, during one of his many changes of heart in the poem. But Homer envisioned something like a phenomenology of rage in this scene. The more he gazed, the deeper his anger went. For Achilles, anger is more than affect. It's an adjunct of perception itself. Only once he's thrilled his heart with looking hard at the armor's well-wrought beauty does he break off his furious gaze. Far from blinding him, rage furnishes this exceptional character with a singular perspective on things. So why does Achilles alone rage at this world of immortal work? Maybe it has something to do with the sense of vocation. In Book 9 of the Iliad, we find him in his tent, plucking strong and clear on the fine lyre he won in battle long ago, singing the famous deeds of fighting heroes. I can't help feeling this armchair bard would have made a passable poet in a different world. Isn't every poet a sulky egotist with a hyperactive death drive, after all? But Achilles is born to fight, not to sing. Anything that comes between him and his bloody vocation, including the beautifully carved lyre, its bridge set firm, must be cast aside for him to follow his calling. Not even life itself matters more to him than this grim occupation. Hard on the heels of Hector's death, your death must come at once, his mother warns him. But Achilles only retorts, then let me die at once. What's the point of living if you can no longer kill? Achilles doesn't work to live. He lives to work. Homer uses the word ergon, which means something like labor, to describe the hero's exertions on the battlefield. And his business is death. Wonder, for the Greeks, led to a very different sort of vocation. We see this illustrated in a scene from Plato's Theaetetus, where Socrates plays his customary role of career counselor to a youth he's interrogated to the point of utter perplexity. Theaetetus. By the gods, Socrates, I am lost in wonder when I think of all these things, and sometimes when I regard them, it really makes my head swim. Socrates. It seems that Theodorus was not far from the truth when he guessed what kind of person you are, he's speaking at Theaetetus. For this is an experience which is characteristic of a philosopher, this wondering Thomasine. 
This is where philosophy begins and nowhere else. Funny how Theaetetus must first become lost in wonder in order to find himself. He learns what kind of person he is, a philosopher, from his brush with Thomasine. For Plato, wonder is where philosophy begins and nowhere else. No wonder, no philosophers. Even Aristotle, who built a whole philosophical system from his lover's quarrel with Plato, agrees on this point. It is through wonder that men now begin and originally began to philosophize, he observes in the Metaphysics, wondering in the first place at obvious perplexities, and then by gradual progression raising questions about the greater matters too, e.g. about the changes of the moon and of the sun, about the stars, and about the origin of the universe. If this sounds familiar, it's because we've come full circle to the origin of the cosmos, the earth, the stars, the inexhaustible blazing sun and the moon rounding full that Hephaestus hammered onto the shield's bright circumference in the first place. But we've yet to consider those greater matters that form the astronomical rungs on Aristotle's ladder of Thaumazide, the moon, the sun, the stars, and the origin of the universe. So let's take the next step in Wonder's philosophical progression and look to the moon. So this is the second part, two, uh, worlds beyond. Sooner or later, the moon pops up on pretty much every poet's literary horizon. Whether you're a Japanese courtesan, a Yoruban folk singer, or a conceptualist cosmonaut, it's as close as the art comes to a timeless universal motif. But how many poets ever make the moon new? Nearly 350 years ago, John Milton managed to work a nifty little lunar renovation into the epic paraphernalia of Paradise Lost, as the irrepressible Satan, after nine days and nights in free fall from the battlefield of heaven, takes up arms once again. His ponderous shield, <clears throat> ethereal temper, massy, large and round, behind him cast. The broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon, whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views at evening from the top of Fiesole, or in Valdarno to descry new lands, rivers or mountains in her spotty globe. Even the most pious poet can't resist a bit of literary vandalism now and then. Emblazoning the full moon on Satan's shield, Milton blots out the classical world of Achilles' shield, just as Paradise Lost will, he hopes, eclipse the Iliad in the annals of literary history someday. We'll come back to eclipses a little later in this talk. Massy, yet also ethereal in temper, this literary shield is another impossible object. It belongs to that wondrous category of things that hold dual citizenship in the realms of the material and the ideal, like a poem, or an angel, or the venerable moon itself. Since antiquity, astronomers had speculated about the moon's ontology. Was it composed of ethereal vapors, or massy like the earth? Until Milton's Tuscan artist put these theories to the proof with the aid of his optic glass. Oddly, we don't really see much of the moon on Satan's shield. Superimposed on its spotty globe, we find a portrait of Galileo Galilei, the man in Milton's moon, who, more than any poet or rebel angel, revolutionized our view of the heavens above. Milton visited Galileo, by then old, blind, and under house arrest, in Florence during the summer of 1638. DreamWorks has been sitting on my script of this story for ages. In his book, The Starry Messenger, Galileo had published the first topographical drawings of the moon's surface to appear in the West nearly three decades earlier. Peering through his telescope, the Florentine astronomer marveled at a cratered and mountainous terrain that defied expectation. 
The surface of the moon is not even, smooth, and perfectly spherical, as the majority of philosophers have conjectured that it and their other celestial bodies are. But, on the contrary, rough and uneven, and covered with cavities and protuberances, just like the face of the earth, which is rendered diverse by lofty mountains and deep valleys. So this is like a big, this blew everyone's mind. Galileo discovered that the moon, too, was a world, just like ours. Look closely at that progression of topological nouns ending Milton's lines in the description of Satan's shield, and you'll see how the moon came of age as a world in this period, from a flat circumference to a volumetric orb to a map maker's globe. In Galileo's wake, the French engraver Claude Mellon's moon maps would soon highlight the chiaroscuro curvature of the lunar orb. By the end of the 18th century, the moon had assumed world-like dimensions in the British artist John Russell's Orient Globe. All this time, the Earth was yielding its last blank spots, known as Sleeping Beauties, to geography. But now, another spotty globe offered new lands, rivers, or mountains to be mapped. And the moon was only the beginning. The moon on Satan's shield heralds a revolution in the history of cosmological wonder. Galileo's telescope revealed a host of worlds in the heavens above. New moons circling Jupiter, stars never before seen by the human eye, all swiftly incorporated into blind Milton's literary vision of the cosmos. Paradise Lost stages a mask of wonder beneath this canopy of plural worlds. Awestruck, Adam delivers, delivers a hamletic soliloquy on outer space in the poem, which makes of this earth a spot, a grain, an atom with the firmament compared, and all her numbered stars that seem to roll spaces incomprehensible. Milton himself wonders if God might ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. World in the plural appears frequently in the poem. Satan, too, plays the amateur cosmologist, speculating that space may produce other worlds for his legions to invade following their expulsion from the kingdom of heaven. If you find Paradise Lost slow going, try reading it as science fiction. Spielberg, what are you waiting for? Nebulous monsters wing their way through star systems. Angels and demons alike imagine humans colonizing other planets. For the first time in English poetry, I should say as far as I know, uh, we view the earth from outer space. That globe whose hither side with light from hence though but reflected shines, half cloaked in brightness and half in shadow. I could go on, but amid all this, the archangel Raphael warns Adam, and by extension, Star Trek aficionados everywhere, to dream not of other worlds, what creatures there live, in what state, condition, or degree. Wonder, like the moon, has a dark side. Let's not forget that the most wonderstruck character in Paradise Lost also happens to be the most fiendish by far. Unlike furious Achilles, who can only feel rage when he sees the shield, Satan simply can't stop mooning over creation. From the stairway to heaven, he looks down with wonder at the earth below. Once Satan has touched down on our planet, he gazes upon Eden with new wonder. When he first sees Adam and Eve, he's overcome by wonder and could love them too. Satan's vulnerability to wonder is frankly endearing. I, for one, can't help feeling sympathy for the poor devil when we last see him, at the conclusion of his final speech to the rebel angels in hell, still wondering to the bitter end. And this is the scene where Satan is, is giving his speech, right? He stood, expecting their universal shout and high applause to fill his ear, when contrary, he hears on all sides, from innumerable tongues, a dismal, universal hiss, the sound of public scorn. 
He wondered, but not long had leisure, wondering at himself now more. His visage drawn he felt to sharp and spare. His arms clung to his ribs, his legs entwining each other, till supplanted, down he fell, a monstrous serpent on his belly prone. I felt this way myself after poetry reading sometimes. Isn't every poet an unemployed angel trapped in a reptile's body after all? The last thing Satan wonders at in Paradise Lost isn't a newly discovered planet or humankind, but himself transformed into a serpent. You'd expect him to feel horror at this grotesque Ovidian metamorphosis, his cranium warping hideously, his arms fusing into his torso, his legs corkscrewing into a scaly tail. But Satan's wondrous journey through the cosmos ends where it began, in a failure to see himself for what he really is. Maybe dreaming too much of worlds beyond reach can make a monster of you. Worlds swim through paradise lost like bubbles in a glass of champagne. But Milton cautions us not to lose sight of ourselves in this teeming universe. Who's more blind to this world of ours than the astronomer squinting into his telescope's eyepiece? They can foresee a future eclipse of the sun, writes Augustine in his Confessions, but they do not perceive their own eclipse in the present. I suspect Milton had this sort of inner eclipse in mind when he described Satan's dusky radiance following the archangel's fall from heaven. This is in the first book of Paradise Lost. His form had not yet lost all her original brightness, nor appeared less than archangel ruined and the excess of glory obscured, as when the sun, new risen, looks through the horizontal misty air shorn of his beams, or from behind the moon in dim eclipse disastrous twilight sheds on half the nations and with fear of change perplexes monarchs. Darkened so, yet shone above them all the arch archangel. Milton's selenographic shield proudly advertises Galileo's discoveries, but its spotty globe also reminds us that Lucifer, the erstwhile bringer of light, is in truth eclipse personified dark and so, yet shown above them all, the archangel. In fact, someone pointed out in an earlier talk that Satan holding the moon shield before him would be acting out the uh, uh, arrangement of an eclipse. Nothing discloses the dark side of wonder like an eclipse. I saw one once through a piece of welder's glass in a derelict park on the other side of the planet. Even the crows seemed perplexed by its disastrous twilight. There was an uncanny chill, as if a refrigerator door had swung open inside me. But the wonder of it all wasn't that the sun had been blotted out overhead. What stopped my breath was the slow silhouette of another world gliding into view. Three, worlds within. Three centuries after Paradise Lost first lit up the Western literary firmament, the American poet, cookbook author, and marijuana enthusiast Ronald Johnson purchased an 1897 edition of Milton's poem in a Seattle bookshop and promptly began to black out most of the text from its pages. Why would anyone so meticulously deface an already outdated copy, it's an 1897 edition, of the venerable Puritan epic. I thought it would be funny, Johnson later explained, like a sheepish delinquent caught spray painting a cathedral. But I decided you don't tamper with Milton to be funny. You have to be serious. This is from an interview with Peter O'Leary. Peter O'Leary. What began as a little joke at Milton's expense developed into a postmodernist masterpiece of literary eclipse in its own right. Blot out the first and last two letters of paradise, and you have Rady. Lose the first and last letters of lost, and you have O's. 
Even the title of the poem Johnson fashioned from this procedure, Radios, is ordained solely from Milton's dark materials. Before publishing this literary curio, Johnson scrupulously whitewashed the epic he'd defaced, yielding a photographic negative of his poetic eclipse. Nobody wrote radios. The poem was wondrously erased into existence. Its author's words are nowhere to be found in this work, and yet, like Milton's creator, he's everywhere. They kind of think of erasure as a kind of like technology of writing uh, to be thought of alongside the shield as a form of technology. There is another world, the French poet Paul Eluard once said, but it is inside this one. I think Johnson would gently amend this to say there are other worlds, but they are inside this one. Turning the astronomical theater of Paradise Lost inside out, Johnson investigates the plurality of worlds within. Worlds that both in him and all things drive deepest, is a quote from Radios. A little textual puzzle from Ark, the cosmological epic that Johnson labored over for 20 years, illustrates the wondrous multiplication of inner worlds throughout this poet's work. And so this is Earth, 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 Earth. The literary critic Stephen Burt deciphers the secret messages embedded in this concrete poem. Earth, Earth, Earth. Here, the art hearth. Here, the art. Here, the art. Sampling a Jeremiah from the King James Bible, O Earth, 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 hear the word, uh, word of the Lord. Johnson composes a manifold matrix of worlds. It's one thing to register the verse in universe, and another entirely to dream up a poetics of the multiverse. The erasurist's decision not to delete the S that pluralizes this book's title makes worlds of this difference. Radios isn't a radio. It's an orchestra of radios. Well, that's not quite right. See that cesura fracturing the poem's title? An imaginary number of broken radios hums and buzzes inside this impossible literary object. One radio may tune into a single frequency at a time, but a chorus of broken radios can broadcast everything from an infernal racket to the music of the spheres all at once. You don't tamper with Milton to be funny, our holy fool may attest, but for all its radical theology, radios is, in the end, a divine musical comedy. Listen carefully, and you'll hear a marvelously cracked piece of postmodern music behind the curtain of Johnson's literary performance. At a party with his students one night, so the story goes, the poet first heard a recording of Baroque variations by the composer Lucas Foss. At one point in the work, a xylophone spells out Johannes Sebastian Bach in Morse code. Elsewhere, a highly trained musician smashes a bottle with a hammer. Johnson's various enthusiasms must have lined up nicely that evening because he embarked upon the solitary quest in the cloud chamber that would become radios the very next day. In the dedicatory note to his book, Johnson quotes Foss's liner notes for Variation 1 on a Larghetto by Handel as a sort of key to his own work. And I'll, I'll read this to you. So these are Foss's liner notes. Groups of instruments play the Larghetto but keep submerging into inaudibility rather than pausing. Handel's notes are always present, but often inaudible. The inaudible moments leave holes in Handel's music, and he says parenthetically, I compose the holes. The perforated Handel is played by different groups of the orchestra in three different keys at one point, in four different speeds at another. Handel's Larghetto 
may very well be the most beautiful melody the composer ever wrote. Let's listen to the always present but often inaudible music behind Foss's Variation 1. Now, here's the otherworldly beauty of Handel under Eclipse. It's hard not to hear broken radios searching for a classical music broadcast in this perforated Larghetto's eerie harmonics and bursts of sonority. It gets kind of zanier and zanier as it goes along. If you find radio slow going, try reading it as the libretto for a post-structuralist space opera. Lyrics erased by Johnson, score perforated by Foss. The wonder of variations in music, in evolutionary biology, and beyond is how one variation begets another, though you never know what you'll beget. Perforating Paradise Lost, Johnson produced a literary variation, radios, on Foss's musical variation, Baroque variations, on a Baroque contemporary of Milton, Handel, whose body of work includes dozens of variations in its own right. To see how radios makes possible even further variations on itself, let's turn to the page in Milton's poem where Satan's shield first appears. Now, what if somebody other than Johnson, say a young woman in rural New England on a snowy night long ago, were to compose her own holes in this dark material? I'll read this to you. To you. Can thunder here, here in my unhappy unha mansion, but that voice of fire scarce ceased the ethereal artist in her globe of marl steps on and on. It's hardly because I could not stop for death, but you get the idea. There are innumerable poems encrypted in the harmonious numbers of Paradise Lost. I can even hear echoes of the sadly underrated poet, occasional film extra, and Ronald Johnson enthusiast Srikanth Reddy in this literary cloud chamber. The mind is a matter, my friends, of voice, the edge of it moving like glass, its rivers but burn, in rivers but burning. Okay. I could do this forever, and that's exactly the point. You could too. I suspect that's why Johnson breaks off his own work at book four of Paradise Lost leaving nearly 7,000 lines of pristine Miltonic pentameters for others to cross out someday. Radio's kind of wrote itself, said the author of this incomplete erasure. People don't often talk about the fact that it's not a, a completed work. I think it ended when it needed to end, and I didn't need to add the rest, says Johnson. An open-ended variation on Milton's song Radios invites us 
to add the rest. And why stop at Paradise Lost, really? Compose your own holes in any book. Alice in Wonderland, the Constitution of the United States of America, the Rig Veda, and you'll unearth a manifold matrix of worlds within. A literary multiverse, Radios is riddled with cosmological wormholes, theological rabbit holes, and plain old typographical holes. From the O tree, rhyming with poetry, that begins the poem, O tree, to the O for the apocalypse that trumpets the poem's closing revelations, Johnson makes us see the whole, H-O-L-E, in whole, W-H-O-L-E, and he makes us hear the whole, H-O-L-E, in holy. There's a hole in wonder, too, though I'd never passed through it until I came across the following page in radios. And this is a page that you have here. A mind to be changed by place or lace, heaven of hell, astonished on the oblivious pool, the O of wonder, circumference hung on shoulders like the moon, whose optic glass at evening from the top new globe of some great burning azure vaulted. The first time I read this passage, I had no idea what lay behind it. But that floating little phrase, the O of wonder, kept looping around in my head. So I dug up an old copy of Paradise Lost to read the Miltonic original and was wonderstruck. And I don't think I was wonderstruck by the fact of this transmission of this trope across millennia. Uh, I think what I really I felt was like wonder at the world. Uh, over 3,000 years ago, a blind Greek poet pictured the world on an ancient shield. Two and a half millennia later, the moon magnified by an optic glass eclipsed Homer's world in a theological poem of Reformation England. In my own lifetime, I was four, astronauts had set foot on the moon's surface only a few years earlier. A little-known American poet erased Milton's spotty globe all the way down to a wondrous O. Oh. World, moon, O. Oh. The word for when things line up this way is a syzygy. The microscopic linkage of chromosomes necessary for reproduction in our species is one example. An eclipse, when three celestial bodies line up in astronomical space, is another. The word syzygy is itself a syzygy, which almost makes me believe in intelligent design, as far as language is concerned. Read aloud its sequence of three identical vowels land lined up in a row, Y, 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 and you'll hear mankind grappling with the mystery of causation. Let's not overlook that linked chain of O's in the O of wonder, either. It's a syzygy, too. Why? 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 Oh. 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 We all live that song. So many images flicker through this O in radios. A full moon. A ghostly shield. A hole in a page from a time-worn edition of Paradise Lost. But I always return to a mouth open in wonder. When we see golden acrobats turning handsprings on an ancient shield, or when the mountains of the moon first swim into focus through a telescope's eyepiece, we say, oh, hardly aware that our lips are assuming the shape of the signifier itself. The O of wonder, Johnson shows us, is the O in wonder, in the word wonder. I can't think of any other word where our writing system, our letter O, and the morphology of speech, the shape our mouth makes, enter into such wondrous alignment. But the mouth forms an O in arousal, and in hunger, and in death's terminal rictus, too. Thy mouth was open, George Herbert says to death personified, but thou couldst not sing. There's no such thing as pure or simple wonder. When Thaumazine forces our lips into an O, all those ancient drives, from Eros to Thanatos, move through us as well. 
The art of poetry traditionally originates in this inexhaustible, sonorous O. Oh. O oh, muse, O oh, lord, O oh, my love, O oh, late capitalism, O oh, etc. The O oh that Johnson plucks out of wonder invokes endless poetic variation. With all due respect to Plato and Aristotle, philosophy isn't the only vocation that springs from Thomasine. If you look closely at the O of Wonder, you'll see a poem beginning there too. <laughs> 